Hey everyone, it's Chris for Two Months Guitars and Basses. Welcome to a very special episode. This time we have Mike Lewis from Custom Shop, from the Fender Custom Shop. Mike, I hope you're doing well. Doing well. Great. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So, so nice. Thanks for taking time for us. And uh, to begin with, I think it would make sense to uh, let you introduce yourself to those people who are not that familiar with the Fender Custom Shop team, who does what, what your role is, that kind of things. Okay. Well, I'm uh, Michael Lewis. I'm the VP of Product Development at the Fender Custom Shop. And, um, you know, since we are a custom shop, the idea of product development, you think, well, what does that really mean when it comes to a custom shop? So yes, we do um, primarily do custom guitars as ordered by our customers. And I can tell you that it's the vast majority of what we do is custom one-offs for dealers and or individuals who go to their dealers and order their guitar. But we do also do limited editions, signature models and things like that. So I uh, directly involved in developing those products, but also in the custom shop, we consider development as it would pertain to an option that we offer on guitars. All right. You know, so someone can order, a, you know, say you want to order a 57 Stratocaster. I love 57 Strats and I want my 57 Strat. However, I would like some different pickups. I would like some different woods. I would like some different wirings and things like that. And we have a, a vast um, selection of options that we offer. And so all those options have to be developed. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So pickups yeah. have to be developed. Wirings have to be developed. Uh, finish options get developed. We source with different kinds of woods. We test them, listen to them, colors, paint, things like that. All that needs to be developed. And then once it passes our test, so to speak, uh, then we can offer it to you uh, as an option that you can choose for your custom guitar. So right. that's primarily what I do. Wow. Okay. That sounds like a lot, <laughs> to be honest. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're a busy man. <laughs> Great. So um, I'm personally very, very happy about uh, the 17th anniversary of the broadcaster. You guys brought out this beautiful reissue. Um, can you tell us a little about this guitar? Well, sure. The broadcaster, um, it's a very interesting story. Uh, back in, you know, the very late 40s, like 1949, they started to develop the solid body uh, Spanish style guitar. When I say Spanish, I mean played like this, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, as opposed to the Hawaiian style, which was played in the lap like this. So when Fender first started developing the Spanish style electric guitar, um, you know, it was, it was new. It was becoming popular uh, in, among musicians and, uh, you know, Fender sales went to Leo and said, hey, we need a Spanish style electric guitar. And so Leo gets to work and by the early 50s, he develops a guitar and he calls it the Esquire. And it's a single pickup guitar and everybody knows it, right? It, it looks like a Telecaster, same basic shape and everything. Guitar comes out and it was completely different, completely new. Uh, everybody actually kind of laughed at it, thought it was funny, you know, because, um, you know, electric guitars prior to that were completely different. They were hollow bodies, they had set necks, and and uh, Leo Fender's idea was, hey, it should be serviceable, should be something that lasts forever, uh, and, you know, the sound should be pure. You know, he, he really liked steel guitars because that's what he made a lot of. And they liked that sound and he loved Western swing music. So when you look at the original Esquire, it's definitely geared towards that. Well, pretty soon after they introduced that, uh, people said, well, this is great, but, you know, we really think we need two pickups. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so he, 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 you know, adds the option for a neck pickup and you could order the Esquire with a single pickup or a double pickup. And by the time they did the, the neck pickup, they had incorporated the um, the ash body and the blonde finish, which we call butterscotch. 
And so then it was a little confusing. People would say, oh, this is great. Now, which is it? Is it one pickup or two pickups? Yeah. Yeah. You know? So it eventually, uh, towards the end of the year, they would, they discontinued the double pickup Esquire. Okay. okay. And reintroduced it as the broadcaster. And then in subsequent years, the Esquire came back as a single pickup model only. So actually, the double Esquire predates the broadcaster. Wow. Okay. I never which, knew that. Yeah. Even though I we, thought I know a, a lot about tellies. Yeah. Great. It's, it's, it's an interesting sort of piece of lost history, you know? Yeah. And, you know, so the, the 1950 uh, double Esquire is virtually the same as a broadcaster. A okay. couple little differences, obviously, because of the broadcaster decal. And then everybody knows the rest of the story. Uh, shortly after uh, the broadcaster came out, you know, they got a, a Fender got a letter from uh, the Gretsch company saying, hey, we've got this name, the broadcaster, it's a registered trademark, so please, you know, stop using the name. Yeah. <laughs> and so before they even thought of a new name, they would cut off the word broadcaster on the headstock. <laughs> And it's it one of said, my favorite stories about yeah. Leo. <laughs> and it just said uh, Fender. And meanwhile, they're you know trying to think of a name, and they sort of had a contest. Uh, you know, there was a memo where the handwritten thing on the memo was um, maybe we should have a contest amongst the salesmen to come up with a new name. You know, and we still have some of those original documents. It's, it's oh. in, a, in a box. You know, we have all these old letters and stuff. Oh, great. So. The name Telecaster came about because television was the new thing. It was up and coming. It was the future. And obviously, Broadcaster, the name Broadcaster was chosen because uh, the most popular media at the time, the only media at the time, was radio broadcasting. So they called the guitar Broadcaster, and then they changed it to Telecaster because that was the future. Tele you know, Television was new. And then later, uh, the Stratocaster, Stratosphere, space race, you know, it was all futuristic. It's very, very cool. So the, broad <laughs> the broadcaster, um, when we decided to do this guitar for the 70th anniversary, um, back, in, back in 2010 or so, when we did the American Vintage revamp, we looked at numerous vintage guitars. Dozens of different ones, Telecasters, Stratocasters, Esquires, and a couple of Broadcasters. This one particular Broadcaster that we saw uh, was just spectacular, you know. And if if you've seen many actual original Broadcasters, you know that they're all different. It was very ex experimental in the early days, and um, many of the early ones were really prototypes, you know, and uh, so you never, you kind of never know what you get, you know, the, the, <laughs> the neck shapes are all different, um, many, many different things. So, but this particular one was just a spectacular example. So we said, okay, let's, let's use this one. And so we documented it. We knew in, in the in back of my mind, I knew that like in 10 years, we were going to do this guitar, right? Because the anniversary wow. was coming up. So we documented it, took photos, everything, and just archived those specs. And then when it came time to do the, the broadcaster for the anniversary, we pulled out the specs and looked at it really closely and specced it out, made a few prototypes, and then there we have it. So right. we're going to do, we did a, uh, we're doing a, a master built version where there are 70 pieces only, and wow. they're d divided up amongst all the different builders. Oh, great. Right. And it's sort of, sort of the luck of the draw, you know, this is one of the only cases really where you can't choose your builder. Uh, you order one and you, you, you might get a, a Dale Wilson, you might get a Jason Smith, you know, you might get a Yuri Shishkov. And uh, so they're in the process right now of building those. And we're also doing a team built version, which is limited to orders in 2020. Oh, so as many as people right. want to order. Uh, we'll build them, and if you wait till December 31st to order yours, we'll still build it. 
<laughs> and that one comes in, in four different uh, finish packages. You can get it in uh, what we call Time Capsule, which is sort of a variation of an NOS or new old stock version. The Time Capsule is very unique where the finish is like this flash coat lacquer finish and it's it's not buffed. Just like the uh, original like the original guitars where the the top coat has a high thinner content uh, and lacquer and they spray it on and the thinner evaporates and the, the lacquer wraps around the body real fast. Oh wow. And there's no buffing needed. However, when you look at it really close, it's not glassy smooth. Uh, all right. You know, okay. Like a like a typical more modern buffed guitar. Um and then the hardware is uh, the classic classic hardware where it's slightly beat up just a little bit, a little bit of patina to it. So it looks like what a guitar could look like if it was never opened. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> like you open the case for the first time after it's been sitting in there for 70 years, what it might look like. Wow. And then then we also have um, the uh, Journeyman Relic, which is very possible, uh, very popular a regular relic and a heavy relic option as well. And all of those are flash coat lacquer as well. No, no right. buffing. So very, very, right. very, very nice. The, uh, the next shape on this one is uh, the profile we took directly off this example that we found. Uh, it's, it's unique and different than anything we've ever done. You know, it's, it's not small, but it's not gigantic either. It's just really, really nice. Um, you know, those who've picked it up and go, yeah, this is, you know, this feels old. <laughs> great, great. You know, another another interesting thing we, we learned in looking at some of these old original black guard guitars, meaning, you know, blonde tellies with black pick guards. Um, we noticed that, there you go. We noticed that many of the earliest ones had a compound radius on the fingerboard oh really yeah you know everybody thinks the original radius was seven and a quarter and yeah. most most of them were uh, but you know many of the earliest ones we looked at actually had seven and a quarter to nine and a half wow now, i'm sure that was not intentional you know, <laughs> just the way they came out you know it happened yeah yeah it just happened and it just it's it's a great feel so we thought this is cool let's do that the pickups in here, um, we actually developed them a few years ago when we introduced the double Esquire mm -hmm. in our, um, in one of our, um, uh, it's called Vintage Custom Series. So we have a double Esquire in there and we developed these pickups and these are, again, looking at old, old guitars, we found that some of the specs that were actually incorporated in the pickups were different than what was documented. Hmm. Because you know that they were experimenting, always changing things, and they would get parts from wherever they would get them. Maybe they would run out of something and use something different. Who knows? But we saw a few guitars that had um, extra large diameter Alnico 3s oh. in the uh, bridge pickup. And the, actual, and the wire was actually thinner than what you normally would see. So, you know, we, we discovered that some of the pickups, earliest ones had these big diameter Alnico 3 magnets and 43 gauge wire, which is a little bit thinner. Thinner, yeah. So you think about that, you got bigger magnets, thinner wire. Uh, it allows you to put more wraps of wire because it's a little bit thinner. Um, so the combination of those two elements and the fact that they were not dipped in wax, they were either not dipped at all, not potted at all. Some of the pickups were potted in shellac. Some were potted in lacquer. Wow. Um, uh, the wax thing didn't come till later, but you know, they have to sort of hold the pickup together, you know? And so the lacquer and the shellac have a really, have a similar viscosity um, but the shellac seemed to be a little bit better in terms of reducing microphonics. Okay. However, the sound is almost, it's almost as if they're not potted at all. Really open. Okay. Lively sounding. So these pickups, you know, utilize those magnets, that wire, and uh, they're potted in shellac. 
Shellac. And of course, the DC resistance and everything matches some of these earlier pickups that we found. So it's probably the closest thing to the original that you could get. Now on the neck pickup, we we found that some of the, you know, a lot of the original neck pickups had Alnico 5 magnets. And they're all, they were also the larger diameter and the 43 gauge wire. So we're going, okay, cool, this is great. So the result is a really loud, open, bright sounding neck pickup. Sounds Which, like a dream. It's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> then, then wait, it's, it's, it even gets better. <laughs> no way. So you look at the original wiring on the broadcaster and there was no tone control. Okay? Yeah. It was just, you know, the three-way switch all the way down on the rear. It was the bridge pickup with the volume. And then the other control was a blend for the neck. Okay, so you could blend in that neck pickup wherever you wanted, either okay. full neck and bridge or any amount of neck blended in with that bridge. Yeah, yeah. So that right there, those are the lost broadcaster sounds. Oh, great. You cannot get those tones on a regular Telecaster no. uh, because there's no blend, right? So what a lot of people like to do is just, you know, flip that switch down into the rear, turn that blend knob just a little bit counterclockwise and blend in just a little bit of that neck and it fattens up the guitar. It, and it sounds like this big fat bridge pickup, right? Yeah. Oh, now I need to try that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then in the, in, the, in the middle position on the switch, it's just the neck by itself with volume only. Okay, so oh. once you once you take out the tone control, okay, you're what you're doing is you're reducing the amount of load that's on that pickup. So it's louder, it's brighter, it's fuller. So right there, you got a, a you know a neck pickup that's like the volume is almost equal to the bridge pickup. Then you flip to the, the forward position on the switch and the original wiring had this big fat capacitor on it on the neck pickup that made For it the bass sound. Yeah, really. Yeah, really, really bassy. Yeah. And, you know, so we're looking at that thinking like, why, you know, why, you know, why, <laughs> you know, like, why, 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 why do we think that they did that? And, then of course, <laughs> and of course, you realize that the electric bass really hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. And or it was about to be invented. And, you know, maybe maybe someone thought, hey, we need a real bassy sound so we could, you know, you know, fill out fill out the band. So but as years went by, you know, people would deem that setting not very useful. Yeah. So what we did was we just changed the value of the capacitor All to right. a very small value. And what it does is it just rolls off a little bit of the highs off that neck pickup and the original wiring had a 15k resistor in there that lowered the volume on that pickup in the yeah. forward position so we changed that from a 15k resistor to a 10k resistor so i get a little bit more volume and some of that just a little bit of the highs are rolled off so it actually sounds like a traditional tele neck pickup oh wow okay so you have this sort of a preset warmer kind of rhythm sound when you flip the switch all the way to the forward. And if you flip it back to the middle, you've got the neck pickup loud, bright, open, full, very open. It's really, really cool. So we call that the modified black art wiring. Oh, now, yeah. if, if, you know, if, if the player, when you get that guitar and you notice this weird switching and, you know, you don't have a combination in the middle position, and if you can't deal with that, we understand. So we, in the case, we include uh, a completely separate control panel, control plate with pots and wiring with the, with the modern tele wiring, if you want to just pop that in. Solder right, which wires, are, and you're good which to go. Which then has the tone pod and the volume pod and... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. That's a nice case, Candy. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> wow. Wow. Typically, yeah. uh, on all the guitars that we do that have that modified, you know, 50, 51 blackguard wiring, we'll, in, we'll include that accessory as well. You know, in the old days, in the original days of the custom shop, we did a lot of real vintage accurate 
reissues, you know. And then, you know, it went, kind of went from there to really elaborate art guitars, right? But over the years, you know, customers and players, they sort of, they want the vintage platform, you know, from, from five feet away, they want it to look and sound and feel when you're playing it like a like an original classic Fender, but hardly anybody ever orders it with 100% vintage specs. Hmm. Most of the time, uh, the players are, want a little bit bigger fret, a little bit taller yeah. fret, maybe a little flatter fingerboard. Um, and they always want the five-way switch on a Strat. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time. I still use a three-way switch, but... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so, you know, then the players want the reverse wound, reverse polarity, middle pickup on a, on a Strat. And there's countless wiring options for combining the pickups, you know, different ways. So, you know, most of our orders are sort of customized vintage style guitars, you know, and we have woods that we offer, flame, roasted, you know, bird's eye, you know, all different kind of options and colors, sky's the limit. You know. Crazy. Now, um, I know for a fact that you're an absolute expert on electronics and pickups and the way you talk about them um, shows that it's exactly the case. I would want to ask you if you believe that there's a tonal difference between the uh, reverse wound, reverse polarity, straight middle pickup wiring compared to non-reversed. Because I have a theory and I just I, I would want to know what, what your take is on that. I, you know, I'm one of those people that is kind of cursed with being able to hear things. <laughs> and sometimes you can't tell really what the difference is, but you know something's different. You know what I mean? And sometimes you don't know why it's different, but you know it's different. Uh, in the case of a reverse wound middle pickup in a in a standard one, I hear something different. Um, it's one of those things you can't really put your finger on it. Yeah. You can't really say what's different and you can't really say why it's different, but I hear something different. You know, um, I personally like it myself, standard, you know, not, yeah. not reverse. I, I don't use a, 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 a five way switch on my guitar. Um, but, um, you know, Jimmy Vaughn, for example, he uses a reverse wound pickup mm -hmm. on his guitar in the middle, but he wires it backwards. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's got the yellow wire going to the ground and the black wire yeah. going to the hot. And, um, you know, what, what he gets is when he uses the pickups in, you know, together, like in the second or the uh, fourth position, it's out of phase. Out of phase, yeah. But when you play the middle pickup by itself, it's got the sound, it's, it sounds like it's not reverse wound, reverse yeah. polarity. And it's, you know, I, I guess for me, if I had to characterize it, it's a little bit quicker somehow, a little bit stronger, yeah. a little bit faster sounding, you know, like when you hit it, the, yeah. it's more there, you know, but it's real subtle. The thing about sound though, it's like, Sometimes when you're listening to it and you're listening to somebody else, sometimes you don't hear it as much. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't hear the subtle things as much. But when you're playing it, you do. Because it's more than just hearing. It's so much more. It's the feel and it's the interaction. You know, when like when you when you touch the guitar and you attack it and play things, it reacts a certain way. And only yeah. you know that. Yeah. See when I when I when I talk about this, my I get goosebumps. Yeah, know? yeah. And so what happens is, if you're getting a reaction from your guitar and your amp that really inspires you, do you know what I mean? Like makes you play things that you never played before. You know, then it sounds better. Of course. Of if course. you like it, if if it sounds better to you, then you play better. And everybody else, everybody else hears that and go, man, that sounds great. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, and it's a combination of the instrument and you. 
because right. you react to the instrument in a different way because the instrument inspires you in a way. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I always tell to people who ask about those nuances, like, come on, don't overdo it. Like, are you nuts? It's like 1% difference, what I hear. It's like, yeah, it is maybe 1% what you hear, but I know that I get more inspired if that 1% sits where it sits. And mm -hmm. then I automatically play better, which makes me feel better. So, so I do care. <laughs> That's when we that's when we know we've done our job. All right. When someone right. comes in, picks up a guitar, plays it, and they just keep playing. They keep playing. They keep playing. And they start to play things that they've never played before. It, it yeah. inspires them to play new music. Then we know we've succeeded. Job done. Check. <laughs> <laughs> Great. OK, talking about job done, um, the custom shop has two departments or two parts, the master builders and the team built team, the crew. Uh, how the master builders work is sort of obvious. They work on a project, they do their job, the guitar is done, they take the next one. Um, what's up with the team built? Like how does, how does this look like? Is it, are there like smaller teams within the team built team who do one specific job or do they rotate? Or how, how is this um, organized? Because it's very efficient. You guys do so many guitars and the quality is way up all the time. That's uh, hard to understand. All right, well, first of all, uh, on the team built side, everybody in there uh, is what we would consider the best and the brightest in their particular area of the guitar build. The vast majority of, of the team members uh, worked on the regular Fender factory for, for a lot of years before they came into the custom shop. And there's a lot of tenure in there. You know, of course we have new people, but the majority of the people have been in there for 15, 17, 20, 25, 30 years. Wow. You know, going back to the original days of the custom shop. And even though everybody is cross-trained to some degree, because sometimes people are sick and they, you know, miss work and we have to cover things, you know. But for the most part, everyone is an expert at their particular part of the build. And so, yes, there are teams within the team. You know, we have uh, in, in the paint shop, there's a small team of custom shop painters. All they do is paint custom shop. In the buff and polish area, you know, there's a small team of people that just do that. And of course, the relicking artists, you know, the people who do the relicking, it's a small team within the team. And um, every aspect, whether it be installing frets or sanding or finishing or wiring or uh, pre setup, fit and finish, things like that, uh, every person is an expert at that and they're the, the best at it. <laughs> okay. And it's just, it's a, not a huge team and almost every guitar we do team build goes through just about every one of their hands. Um, in, 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 and in some cases there's just one person who does every one does, does the operation on every guitar in, uh, in some, in some cases. So, they're extremely talented, extremely good at what they do, extremely dedicated, and they, and many of them have been there for so long that um, it's really part of their it's part of their DNA, you know, the custom shop. And we we try to make uh, the shop aspirational. We, we try to make it so that everybody wants to come work there. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, it's a fantastic team. So the way it works actually is when you place your order for a team built guitar, we have this thing called the shop floor traveler. It's a piece of paper, right? That's got a neck section a body section and a hardware and electronics section. And we print out three, three copies of this. And the very first thing that happens is Someone looks at it and goes, oh, I need a, I need a sort for lightweight, uh, an off-center seam 
ash body for this Telecaster. Okay. Okay. Then he looks at the next section. Okay. I need to find a, a neck blank that is triple A bird's eye uh, roasted. Okay. So he, he, he takes that and he goes and he picks the body and he picks the neck, the blanks, right? Looks at them, make sure that the, they look good together, the balanced weight is nice. This will make a nice guitar. So he marks them off. This one is, this body's for this guitar. This neck blank is for the same guitar. The body then goes to the, to the mil, body mill. The neck then goes to the neck mill. <clears throat> and the guys look at the sheet. Okay, I need to make this neck into this, this shape. Person wants a you know a no caster shape and he wants the dimensions to be this at the first fret and and so and such at the twelfth fret and the, he wants this size fret on it. Everyone's different. Yeah. yeah. Okay? If you go into the mill, you see all these necks with this piece of paper wrapped around it, and they're all different. Okay. So how so however many different guitars we're doing each day, most of them are, are one offs. Yeah. You know, occasionally we do two of something, or if it's a limited run, we'll do more. But generally, it's one of one. So, the, you know, the 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 operator's looking, at making this neck, and he's looking at the sheet, and he's measuring every part of it, making it to that spec for that particular guitar. Meanwhile, the same thing's happening in the body. And then they both go to paint. They get finished the way they get finished based on what's on the traveler, the color, the type of finish. And based on that, they're going to sand it a certain way and so on. And then they make their way back. And they go through they go through inner sand and polish and, and repaint it and all these the process based on the type of finish it, that it is. And then it ends up goes to to uh, the final area. OK. And the first thing that happens is the guys in the buff and polish or the aging department, they'll look at the body and the neck. They'll be there together. This neck, this body right next to each other on this rack with the travelers on it. Right. And they're numbered. So the guys in buff and polish. OK, let's let's see what we got here. Oh, this one's a heavy relic. Fantastic. So he takes it over and, and you know, does the job on that. And meanwhile, the, the, the people in the subassembly area are winding the pickups. They're putting the parts and the hardware in a bag. It's got the traveler in there and it shows up at this bench with the neck and the body and the bag of parts. And then the, the, the builder. There's maybe three of them in the team built area. Uh, they'll take all those parts. They'll clean up the neck pocket, take off all the finishing compound and make sure everything fits perfectly and and drill out little parts of the holes and stuff like that to make it all go together together. And then they'll put it together maybe 90 percent. And then from there it goes to what we call tune test. And this is the final final where the guy cuts the nut. He adjusts everything, adjusts the bridge tightens everything down, does the intonation, tests it, perfect. Goes on the rack, one other guy checks it before it goes out. And as far as quality goes, each, each process, as it goes from one stage to the next, they do a quality check, right? Oh my God. Make sure, make sure that it's what it's supposed to be by the time they got it. And if it's not, it goes back. And um, or they ask somebody, what do you think or whatever, you know, and um, everyone's a journey. It's beautiful. We are, wow. When you're in there and you see that everyone is a journey and uh, they take the time to do each one exactly the way the customer orders it. And this, I think, is is that special spice that one should understand when we're talking about custom shop, that each and every guitar and bass that gets finished gets the attention of those who touch it, who build it, who have anything to do with it. And that is what's the, the biggest difference, I think, that that, um, that one has to appreciate and understand well, that, that you, makes the Fender Custom Shop the custom shop. You really hit it on the, hit the nail on the head there because, <clears throat> you know, people will ask me like, what's so special about custom shop guitars, you know? And it's really not the specs. Anybody can make anything to any spec, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really the ingredients, the recipe. And the cook. It's, <laughs> it's the utensils that get used, you know, the equipment. And then 
the cook. You know, so, you know, a lot of our methods are, you know, ancient. <laughs> and a lot of them are modern. Okay, so we modernize some things that make it better. You know, the Fender ethos was always change for improvement only. You know, and Leo Fender never quit. He always would, would the changes that were made were always to make it better, to always make it last longer, you know? And, you know, so we incorporate that kind of concept. You know, if we're gonna change something or a process, that's only to make it better, not to diminish what it is, you know what I mean? So, but the tooling that we use to create the hardware and, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is original tooling. You know, the same tool that made the original jack dish on a Stratocaster is the same one we use today, okay? And that's so great. The, the, the covers, you know, the, the bridge covers on, on, on bases, you know, and, and the tele bridge plates and stuff, it's original tooling. So then you think about that, like those tools made parts that went on guitars that were undoubtedly played by our heroes, yeah. you know? And then you think about the music that was written on those guitars and got recorded and became part of our cultural DNA. You know what I mean? So you walk around that shop and you see these tools and stuff and you think about all the instruments that were made and the music that was produced on those instruments, you know? And then you think about the hands, people's hands that are on those guitars, the tenured hands. What, what about all the guitars that they made and all the music that was written on those guitars and recorded and played? You know, it's, it's, it's a big, it's mojo. So <clears throat> I always say, you know, mojo included. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so what about the parts? You, you mentioned the parts, uh, which also do matter a lot, obviously. Um, like the wood source and, and all the parts, the hardware, um, all the plastics and metal and everything. Uh, do you, does the custom shop have the same uh, source of these materials as like the, the standard factory, the US factory? Okay, it's, uh, it's called the metal shop. And the metal shop is the only thing that the custom shop shares okay. with, with the regular factory. So the metal shop makes all the hardware and pick guards and stuff for all the Fender guitars made in Corona. And however, there are some tools that are pretty old and we reserve them for certain custom shop items. Okay. Um, and some of these, some of these tools have had to have been repaired over the years. Um, but we try to preserve as many of them in their original state as possible. And, and, and as opposed to just making a new tool or so outsourcing the part, we'll do everything we can to repair the tool. The only hardware we don't make are um, machine heads, you know, tuning okay. machines. We don't make those. And screws. We buy screws. <laughs> and pretty much everything else. We make we make bridges, bridge covers, pickup bobbins, uh, magnets. Of course, are outsourced, um, but some of the beveling, in some cases, on magnets for done in house. Uh, you know, certain wire. Of course, you have to buy wire, um, and then the raw materials for pick guards. You, you know, we we get that from the same source that it all, that it came from in the beginning. Oh, great! All right, Mike. Thank you very much for joining me for this uh, little chat. Hey, thank you. It's my pleasure. And everybody, please be safe. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. And you guys take it easy. And thank you very much for joining us. You know what to do. Subscribe to the channel. Ring that bell if you enjoy our videos. And uh, we'll see each other very soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you.